these two points, one of them is closer or away, closer to the subdivision or out from the, um, from away from the intersection. So if you drop a perpendicular for these two points here, it's the one furthest away. That's your low point station. I'm just going to call that out here. Low point. This is the existing edge of asphalt. Okay, and then there's a point where the standard width of the pavement ends and then begins again. So that's the beginning of the knuckle, that's the end of the knuckle. And then we go all the way to the last time we have a standard 20, that's the end of the uh, standard 20, right? So between here and here, typical 20 meter right of way. Between here and here, typical 20 meter right of way. And from here forward, we have the cul-de-sac. Between these two points, we have the uh, crescent or the knuckle, the eyebrow, uh, the elbow, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and we determined that the in the standard 20 meter right of way, we want half percent, it's typical minimum, 0.5%. Between here and here, uh, I calculated, you have to check your own, I calculated 1.5%, right? I calculated the length along the gutter, right? This is the length of the gutter. If this is 1% minimum, what does the center line slope have to be between these two points? And then the same thing down here. Uh, the gutter from here all the way around to here had to be a minimum of 1% on both sides. It's actually symmetrical. So if that's 1%, what does the slope along the center line have to be? And we, I determined that to be 1.25. These numbers, 1.5, 1.25, you have to uh, determine those values for yourself based on your geometry. You should practice that calculation we did together because you're going to have to do something similar next semester. And it's a standard calculation you would perform on any of these, uh, any of these roads uh, that require either a crescent, a cul-de-sac, or even at an intersection. You may have to deal with stuff like this. Okay? So it's always good to have practice. Remember what we do, I, I use the phrase, the tail wagging the dog. I'm trying to design the center line, but I have to be mindful of what I have to achieve at the gutter. So I start with the gutter and I say, okay, if my gutter needs to be 1%, what does my center line have to be in order to guarantee that? Okay, so on my center line design, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking ahead a little bit. What's my gutter requirement? Okay. And usually these 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 oddly uh, these odd widenings, crescents and cul-de-sacs, um, they require steeper than typical, right? On a standard 20 meter right of way, you can get away with half percent. That's acceptable. But when you have these longer gutter lines, they want a little bit more. Sometimes 1%. This is the town of Richmond Hill standard. Next semester, I believe the standard is 0.75%. Always steeper than the minimum half. So based on that, then we go to our profile. So on our profile, what we do is in the plan view, we will put points in the plan at these special locations, right? So I identify the station valves. And down at the end here, remember, not the gutter line, but 0.3 meters in. The last point on the asphalt is where that profile starts. Right? Remember this this uh, dimension here is 0 0.3, which is your distance from edge of asphalt to gutter. Okay. So once we draw those points in plan, we can use Civil 3D to project those points from the plan to the profile, and then we have our station values for our profile design. And that's all you get, station locations. Then you have to design the elevations for each of those stations by putting in the appropriate slope. And remember, we're going to go down to the low point, half percent. Then we're going to go positive 0.5 percent, then positive 1.5, positive 0 .5, uh, 0.5, and then positive uh, 1.25. Okay, and that was the profile design. This was the concept, again, and I'm doing this on purpose with a sketch because this is the design. How you do this using Civil 3D, that's a process. Okay, but understanding how to, how to do the design, what the design is, is really what I'm trying to emphasize here. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, Way I'll have to check yours. Okay? There might be an error in the recording. So uh, I'll look at yours again. Okay, send me an email, please. Okay, any questions about the design concept okay, and how we got that profile? Okay, so I'm going to show my AutoCAD again. So in the plan view, I identified those points, right, the edge of asphalt. I identified both of these points, right? Really, you only need one. Which one? The one furthest away from the intersection. So if I drop a perpendicular to the center line, oops, 
this one. So this one here governs. So I would ignore this. Okay, whoops. So that's the station for my uh, for my local. Right? So edge of action is down half percent, then it's all positive. Up half percent, up 1.5, up half percent all the way to here, and then up 1.5 all the way to not the gutter, but the edge of asphalt. That distance is 0.3. So I project those points, I connect the dots, and once I have the station values, then I go into right click and I go to the profile uh, properties. Profile geometry. Table, and I start with I start at the beginning on the grayed out side, and I type these in in order. You have to start at the beginning because whatever I type here is going to change the next elevation, and then whatever I type here is going to change the next elevation. Whatever I type here is going to change the next elevation. So you have to start at the beginning in this column, the grayed out column, and type in all the slopes as required. That's how your profile is designed. And that's where we left off last week. And what I start want to continue with today is the discussion that we're to, what we're working toward is creating a corridor model. And the corridor model requires three parts. The three parts that are required to build any corridor, if you remember from highways, highways is um, you need to know the To know that you need to have the horizontal alignment, which we do, so you should all have a horizontal alignment now as part of assignment two. You need to have a vertical alignment, the design profile, which I've already discussed, and some of you I know have already started doing it, so that's the design for the profile. And then the third element, there's always three building blocks, is the cross section, right? The typical cross section, which in the civil 3D is called the assembly with the sub assembly parts. And I'm going to do something very, very simple. Okay, you might remember from highways. A assembly with the sub-assembly parts that had uh, all the different asphalt layers. Remember, there was two layers of asphalt, two layers of granular. One side had a boulevard uh, with a sidewalk. One side had a boulevard with no sidewalk. All that stuff, right? Well, all the, the, uh, the cross-sectional. Uh, very, very simple. It is common practice to keep this part of it simple, and you'll see. All we really want to do is have the finished ground. I don't need all the underground layers. For uh, estimating purposes, I'm not going to use the corridor. I'm just going to use it for the geometry I need to go forward. The corridor is a requirement to do all your grading design and your servicing design. We'll see how that, that, that all are fit together in the second half, of course. So I have my plan. I have my profile, my design profile. I need a cross section. So to determine the cross section, and this, this is pretty much review from what you did in highways. So if you want to go back and use the uh, modules that you did in highways as, as uh, just a reference, you can. Uh, I don't have them on the course, but you can certainly go back and, and look at yours. Uh, but this is pretty much review, and I'm going to use one, uh, two simple things. One, I need a corridor. Uh, to get the corridor, one of the first things you need is the assembly. So this is the point that connects the pro, that connects the cross section. Assembly. And we're going to do more than one, but this is the basic one. So I want to determine the typical 20 meter right of way. Okay, and you can accept all the defaults. That's just the name. Say OK and pick a point. I generally put it either on the end or the beginning. I'm going to put it at the beginning. Right? When you click, it's going to zoom in on it. And that's all it is. That's the connection point. That's the thing that helps you connect the cross section elements to the plan and the profile of the elements. Okay? So that's the, the, the building. Now we build from this assembly all the sub-assembly parts. So we have to go to our library. So again, the corridor, and we go to the uh, tool pallets. And of all these tool pallets, we're only going to use, out of all these tool pallets, and there's some really complicated stuff, I'm going to keep it very simple. I'm going to go to the generic tab, and I'm only going to use this, what's called link with a width and a slope. So this is the only one I'll ever use in this course. Okay? And for the most part, when I do design for subdivisions, that's that's almost exclusively the only one I ever use. I'm not designing highways. I'm not designing, uh, you know, complicated, um, uh, you know, roundabouts, or I'm not doing anything, uh, you know, multiple lanes and all that sort of stuff. Right? I'm not doing transportation type work. I'm doing simple subdivision roads, which are generally local collector roads. When you get into arterials and freeways, yes, all the other stuff in the library starts to make more sense. 
for the most part, for what the kind of stuff that I'm using or doing in residential subdivisions, this is probably one of the only ones you'll ever need. There are others that are useful, but this is the basic one that I always use. So before I start to use this, we need to look at what the design is. Okay, so I'm going to go back. Let me see if I can do this. I'm going to go back to the standards and look at the cross section. So I'm going to go to the um, course. Go back to, actually, if you go to your desktop, which is where I kept all this, right under the course code, under downloads, under module two, you should have the engineering standards. So we're going to look at this, and if we go to transportation, you'll remember the cross section. I think it's 160. So what we want to look at is all the different pieces from the center to the right of way, right? So from the center line of the road, we want to go down at 2% to the edge of asphalt. Then the gutter has three basic faces. This plane here to the gutter, this almost vertical face, and then the top, flat top. And then from there, we want to go all the way to the street line. So there are one, two, three, four, five pieces. And then it's symmetrical. It's got five on the other side. So we need to read this together with this as well. We need to look at these dimensions. <clears throat> so what I want to determine, we'll do this together. What I want to determine is for the cross section, I want to know how wide each plane is horizontally, and I want to know the slope of each plane. Okay? And there's five elements to do. So I, let me see if I can do this as a sketch. Here we are. So what, let's, let's assume the center line is here. Center line of the road is here, so I'm only going to draw half. Of this is the center line. Of the road. I want to go down to the edge of Asheville. Then I want to go down to the gutter. Then I want to go up to the curved face, and then I want to go to the back of the curve. And let me just draw this in for reference. Here's the curve and the gutter. Right? We're not going to need this. I just want these three. One, two, three. And then I want to go all the way to the street line. The other side. I need to know horizontally. how wide all these pieces are, and I want to know the slope. So how many meters horizontally are all these pieces? And what's the slope? At what slope? At what slope? Okay. So if we remember some of the dimensions, you remember from the center line when we offset to what I call the edge of pavement, this point here, what's the width? What's this width? Anybody remember? Uh, offset from center to edge of pavement, which is the other one. What was this dimension? I don't know. 4.25, that's right, 4.25. Because the edge of pavement, edge of pavement uh, dimension was 8.5, so half of that, 4.25. Okay. If the entire right of way, the entire right of way was 20 meters, how wide is half of it? So this is 10 meters. That was the offset from the street line to the center to begin with, right? So we offset 10, and then we offset 4.25 on both sides. That's how we drew our edge of paper. So if this is 4.25, how do I get from the gutter to the street line? What's this dimension? What's this dimension here? That's right, 5.75. Okay? So now we need to break that down further. If you look at the gutter, how wide is the gutter? What's this dimension from here to here? What's the dimension from the edge of asphalt to the gutter horizontally? Yep, 0 0.3 meters. What's the dimension from the gutter to the back of curve? Remember this dimension, from the gutter to the back of curve. That was another offset you used to draw your back of curve line. 0.2, correct, so 0 0.2 meters. Okay, we're good. Almost there. Okay, so then we've got to break it down. What's the dimension from this point to this point horizontally? What's this gap? This distance here from the gutter to the front top face of curve. Let me show you the dimension. What's the horizontal distance from the gutter point to the top? Ignore the, ignore the fillets, the radius, 25 and 50. Ignore those, right? What's the horizontal distance from the gutter point to the top face of curve? Yep, the last two. Warren and Trump, you're right. So this is 0 0.05 meters. Uh, sorry, 0 0.05, right? To, to 50 millimeters, which is 0 0.05. So if I go back to my sketch, the, 
dimension from here to here horizontally, this distance is 0 0.05. And then what's the distance from the front face <laughs> to the back of the curve? What's this dimension? So the three dimensions horizontally on the curve and gutter are from here to here horizontally, 300. From here to here horizontally, 50 mils, or 0 0.05. And then from the front top of curve to the back top of curve is 0.15. So these are the three horizontal distances. If we know those distances, if this is 425, what's the dimension from center to edge of asphalt? What's this dimension? So we take 425, that takes us from center to gutter. I'm going to subtract 0 0.3 and get 395. Very good. And if the boulevard is 575 from gutter to street line, what's the dimension from the back of curve to the street line? What's this number here? 5.55. Does everybody see where those dimensions are coming from? We started with these two, very general. How do you get from center to gutter? How do you get from gutter to street line? Then we looked at three horizontal distances that are related to the curve and gutter, and then we discounted some of the dimensions to go this way. So these are the horizontal distances. Okay? Those are the widths of all the cross-section elements. Now I want to know the slope of each of these. Okay? Let's do a couple of simple ones. What's the slope of the pavement? the slope of the asphalt, 2%. Okay? And, it, and relative to center, it's negative, so negative 2%. What's the slope of the boulevard? Back to curb to street line. see it now? Can you see my hand waving back and forth? Anybody else? Okay. So let me go back to the dimension. Can you see the cross-section? Town of Richmond Hill cross-section. What's the slope of the boulevard? Two percent. And it's positive. Away from center, it's actually positive. So let me go back to my sketch. So this is negative 2%, this plane, and this one is positive 2%, plus 2%. Okay, if you're moving from center to the outside of the road, you're going down at 2%, up at 2%. So this is at 2% negative, and this is at positive 2%. Right? So the width is 395, it's negative 2%. The width is uh, 555, and it's a positive 2%. Okay? What about the slope of these lines here? Let's get the uh, gutter detail back. What's the slope of the top of curve? What's the slope of the top of curve? Yeah, it's perfectly flat, 0%. Very good. What is the slope of the gutter? Anybody know the slope of the gutter? Well, it's not on here, but you can calculate it. Find the rise and divide by the run. What's the rise of this line? What's the rise? Okay, you're ahead of me, Brian. What's the rise? The rise is right here, 25 millimeters. So if we know the rise is 25, and the horizontal distance is the run, 300, we can take 25 divided by 300 times 100. Yep, wait, very good. So 25 divided by 300 times 100 is actually, and it's negative, right? From center to the edge, it's going downhill. So we're looking at a slope of negative uh, 8.33333. It goes on forever, 8.33%. Okay. 
so this is going to be negative 8.33. A horizontal distance of 0.3 with a slope of negative 8.33. And then this last piece, this face of curve, this almost vertical piece, let's go down to the dimensions. What is the rise of this piece here? What's the vertical distance from this point to this point? That's the rise, yeah. And what's the run? What's the horizontal distance between the gutter and the front face of curve? What's the run? 50. So take the rise, 150, divide by the run, 50, and multiply by 100. No, not 200. The, the rise is 150. The run is 50. So 150 divided by 50 times 100. Rise. Rise over run times 100. Gives you the percent rate. Trump, I think you got it right. 300%. And is it positive or negative? Is it positive or negative? So the slope of this line, the slope of this line here, the slope of this line here is a rise from here to here is 150. The run is 50, remember horizontal 50. So if I take 150 rise divided by the run 50 times 100, the slope of this vertical face here and this piece here is positive 300%. So now I have all the horizontal distance. 395, 0.3, 0 0.05, 0 0.15, 5.55. Those are all the horizontal distances for each piece. And then I have the slope of each piece. This is negative 2. This is negative 8.333. This is positive 300. This is 0. It's perfectly flat across the top. And then this one's positive 2%. So you need to know this dimension, these dimensions, these distances and these slopes. Because what we're going to use is the width and the slope, the width and the slope of each piece, the width and the slope, which is the name of the piece we're going to use. Watch. Go back to AutoCAD. The link with the width and the slope. So you need to know all those widths and all those slopes. Okay? So if you didn't write them down, that's okay. You should do the calculations. You should uh, figure this out, because this is another standard uh, uh, calculation you would perform. If you want to use this cross-section elements, you have to know the width of each piece, you have to know the slope of each piece. Okay? And the slope has to be positive or negative in the direction of center to the outside of the road to the street line. This particular piece. So what I'm going to look at now is, I'm going to, remember I created this and I named it standard 20 meter right away, and I'm only going to use this link with slope. So when I click on it, it's going to bring up a dialog box, and this is where you can set the width. So the first width is 3.95. So I want to use this one here, and I want to change the width to 
and under the generic tab is the link with slope. Click on that. If it doesn't let you type it here, I don't know why it's doing it. Doing that, I've seen the same problem. With some students have described this problem to me before, and this is the workaround. I think you have to select insert. Uh, there's two ways. You can set the you can set the value before you start. There, now it's working. 3.95. Tell it how wide you want it to be, and tell it what the slope should be. The slope should be negative two percent. So you, sh you, you can set the parameters first, or you can create something and then revise it. Okay, so you can go either way. I don't know why it wasn't working, but I've seen that before. Oh, uh, hang on a second. So I got some background noise here. I'll be right back. Hello? Sorry. Just an alarm going off. Problems of working from home. Sorry about that. Uh, so let me go back uh, here. All right. So let me start that again. So once you have your assembly, I'm going to start right from scratch. Okay, so I'm going to go to corridors, create the assembly. I'm going to pick a spot. Give it a name, 20 meter ROW. It's just a name. Leave everything else. Click. It'll zoom to it. Then you want to go to your palettes, corridor, subassembly tool palettes, and you're only ever going to use this one. So in the generic tab, you're only going to use link with slope. Click on it. And again, you should be able to set your parameters first. So 3.95 wide. I want it to be negative 2 down from center. And I'm going to draw, you could do the left or the right. I'm going to do the right side just so it's consistent with the hand sketch that I just did. So when I click, it's going to put that plane in. So that's 3.95 horizontal and negative 2%. The next piece, if you remember, is the gutter, 0.3 wide, and the slope is negative 8.33%. So when I click here, and now I'm going to pick not the center point, but the first point on the outside of this first plane. So click, there's the gutter line. Then I'm going to change this again, 0 0.05 horizontal, and it's positive 300. You don't need the plus sign. Click the, uh, click the last circle. Whoops, do it again. Sorry. So this one is 0 0.05 with a 300%. Oh, shoot, where did it go? Click again, sorry. 3.05, 300. And then I'm going to choose keeps jumping. Sorry, my apologies. 0 0.05 300 and click. And sorry, I'm going to try it one more time. This is causing a lot of grief. It shouldn't be this one more time. So corridor, subassembly tool palettes. I'm not going to dock it. I'm going to click on this one. I want this to be 0 0.05. One last time. It shouldn't be this difficult. Tool palettes, generic, link with slope.
here's the workaround. I'm going to create this 3 meter at 2%, but then I'm going to change it. So I'm going to click here. Oh, I know why. Let me start again. Sorry. Link width slope. Right side, 3.95. My apologies, I don't know why it's not behaving. 3.95. I think we need to insert the circle next to the cone of the center here. Let me sub some. Let me just give it another try. I, I, I never had this problem before, not to this extent. <laughs> Usually you're able to change the parameters before you draw it, which is this thing. So, now I get to change the parameters. Okay, so if it doesn't do that, just accept the defaults and draw it. So I'm just going to draw this piece. And my apologies, I'm not sure why this isn't working. I'm going to draw the piece. Click here. That's 3 at 2%. Notice it's going uphill instead of downhill. Let me just put in five parts. This is another way of doing it. So that's 1, 2, 3, Four, five. These are all three percent, uh, three meters at two percent. Then I'm going to go in and change the parameters of each one now that I've created them. So this one here, I don't want it to be three meters. I want it to be three point nine five, and I want it to be minus two percent. So that's the plane of the asphalt. The next piece should only be 0.3 meters wide, and it should be down at negative eight point three three three. The next piece should be only 0 0.05 meters wide, but positive 300%. So now you'll see the face of the curve. The next piece should be 0.15 wide, 0%. So there's the top front face of the curve. So there are the three planes from your curve and gutter, these three pieces. And then the last piece should be 5.55 at positive 2%, which is the default. So there's your standard half of 20 meter right away. Okay, So there's two ways of doing it. The most direct way is if it allows you, let me see if I can draw the right side. If I link with slope, and if I want to draw the left side, or let me change the parameters. If it doesn't let you change the number here, just accept the defaults. So I'll put in a three meter wide on the left, and I'll put in for the gutter, for the base of the curb, for the top of the curb, and for the other boulevard, and then you can go and change the parameters of each. So that's another way to do it. Just accept the defaults, create the subassembly, and then change the parameters to the width you want. It's 2% and so on. Okay? Once you have one side, if this is symmetrical, which this one is, if it's symmetrical, you can actually mirror the parts. But you can't use AutoCAD mirror. You have to use the Civil 3D mirror command. What you want to do is select all the subassemblies. Do not select the centerpiece. This is called the assembly, and these five parts are the subassemblies. So you only select the subassemblies. You right-click, and you use this mirror command. This is not an AutoCAD command. This is a Civil 3D command. Okay. So again, if it's symmetrical, choose the subassemblies. Do not select the assembly points, just the subassembly, the parts. Right-click mirror, and then choose the center point as the mirror point, and this will mirror vertically on that piece, and you get the other half of the road. Okay, so that's your typical cross-section for 20 meters. As a double check, the distance from this end point, from this end point to this end point, should be 20 meters. Okay, and that's how I know I drew every piece correctly, because the sum of all the pieces on one side is 10. When you mirror it, it's 10 total width of 20. So that's a double check. So again, if you want to create this, usually you're allowed to change the parameter. I don't know why it's not working. Let me try it one more time. So I'm going to go to corridor, create assembly, 
I'm just going to call this temp, something to practice with. I'm going to put it here. And then I want to use link with slope. And usually, like I said, put in, it lets you change the parameters before you start. If it doesn't, if it won't let you type here, then just create it with the, the standard 3 meters of 2%. So I need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 pieces. And then you can revise each piece. And notice when I created this, uh, the default is the left side. If you want the right side, you have to change it. Okay, so I was doing the left side all the time. So if it doesn't allow you to change the parameters here, just accept the defaults and then revise the pieces. So this one, again, I want to change it to a width of 3.95 with a slope of minus 2. This piece here, I want to change it to a width of 0.3 with a slope of negative 8.333. That'll give you the gutter. Then I want the face of curve, which is only 0.05 wide, but it has a 300% slope. There's the front face of curve. The next piece is only a width of 0.15 with a slope 0. It's perfectly flat. And then the last boulevard piece there is going to be 5.55 with a positive 2%, which is the default, so I'll accept that. If it's symmetrical, choose the sub-assemblies. Don't choose the center point, the assembly point. Right-click, mirror. Pick that center point as reference, and it'll mirror it to the other side. And then double-check. End point to end point should be exactly 20 meters. Any questions about creating that? Didn't go as smoothly as I had hoped. I usually like to change the dimensions uh, before I draw the item, right? So I want to draw 385 at negative 2, put it in the drawing. Then draw the gutter dimensions and then put it in the drawing and so on. If that doesn't work for you, like the problem I just had, just create it so you have something and then revise it. Okay, any questions about that? Let me get rid of this. If there's no questions, we can go on to build our corridor now, right? We have a horizontal alignment, right? We have a vertical alignment, the design profile, and we have the sub -assembly, the assembly with the sub-assembly parts. Now I can marry those three things into one more complex object, which is the corridor model. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Any questions before I do that? Go ahead, Claire. What's the question? Actually, here, let me change the... Claire, if you want to ask your question, let me change the settings so that you can share your audio. It's a small enough group. You can unmute yourself if you want, Claire, and ask me a question. Or type it. It's up to you. You should be able to unmute yourself if you want. Okay, Professor, there you I have a, yeah. a question to the uh, at the beginning of the class. It's about the low point. Uh, yes, the low, the low point. The low point. You sent, you, mm -hmm. you sent me an email about this, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah. So my elbow is like the opposite. Is, is your means the low point always comes to a individual like site? Individual, uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, so if I draw the point, if I draw two points, right, there's always two. Yeah, I have two points. I, 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 I don't know how to decide which one is the low point. So, so this is the intersection here, right? Yeah. So of these two points, the yeah. one on center that is farthest away. So in my case, this is further away than this one. So oh, you, you have to draw both. Uh-huh. You mean further so, away? Which one is the further away from the intersection? Yes, yes, the one furthest into the subdivision. Because the, what that does is it puts your low point, because we're going to need catch basins at the low points. Uh -huh. So that puts a catch basin on the end of this curve, yeah. and then it puts a catch basin across the street, uh -huh. not on the curve, but on the line. Okay. Right? So then the catch basin station will be there, not here. So what we want to do is make sure that the catch basin is always on the straight line. So we use the one that's furthest away. Now, again, in my case, the one furthest away is this one, right? So if you look at positive change, it's the right side of the road. It depends yeah. on your geometry. It might be the right, yeah. it might be the left. Yeah. The general statement is whichever point is furthest away from the intersection into the site. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, so, uh, yeah, for example, my elbow is, uh, my, my 
conditioning is the same like you, just as the elbow is uh, like uh, upper way. It's not uh, uh, related to the subdivision, it's just related to the uh, intersection. Yes, the one in the furthest away from the intersection is the low okay. point. You ignore the other one, yeah. Okay, okay. Right, sure. Okay. 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 Tron, if you want. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 yes. So um, I, I think now I understand. It's not related to the subdivision, which way you're, you're close to the subdivision. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank yeah. you. How I just uh, start here? If I understand, yeah. I can do the next step. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Trong, you can use it. You want to use uh, something like this? You want to use one of these? You can if you want to, but for... What I'm going to use the corridor for, I don't need anything underground. I just want the surface. I want the finished ground surface of the road. You'll see why. That's all I need. Okay, so I'm not going to use my uh, corridor to do any quantity, you know, granular asphalt. I'm not going to do my uh, estimate that way. Okay? And in this course, we're not doing any estimating. We're just going to design. Next semester, we're going to use the same technique. We're only going to draw the finished ground. So if I go back to the cross section, right, nothing underground. It's just the finished ground. The surface you would walk on or drive on. The underground layers, the volume of asphalt and granular and concrete for curb and sidewalk, I'm going to do that manually. I'm, going to, I'm just going to get areas times depth. You'll see that the estimating process is a little simplified. For roads, it's useful to have all the underground layers. But for subdivisions, it's it's not that, uh, it's, it's more trouble than it's worth. So I, I don't know too many people who use it for local roads. Really, this is all you need. And you'll see what the, what the purpose of this is in the second half of the course, right? This is key. So let's build the corridor. Okay, so to build the corridor, this is the process. It's very, very simple. You go to corridors, you say create corridor. And then you have to give it a name. I'm going to call mine roads. I only have one road, but I always call it roads. Next semester, this will make more sense. I create one corridor of all the roads together. I don't have a corridor for each individual road. So if I have a, a subdivision of 30 uh, roads, I don't have 30 corridors. I only have one corridor. I add them all to the same corridor. Okay? More about that next semester. It doesn't make a lot of sense today, uh, but next semester it will. So now you have to give it the three pieces. So once you give it a name, I need a horizontal alignment. There's only one. I need a vertical alignment. Now, there's two. Be careful here, right? There's the existing ground, the red dashed line, and then there's the green one, the proposed one. It's the proposed one you want, so be careful here. Make sure you choose the design profile, not the existing ground surface profile. And then you need to choose the assembly, 20-meter right of way. So the plan, the proposed profile, and the cross-section. These are the three basic building blocks of any corridor. That's all you need. So give it a name, plan, profile, cross-section, say OK, and it'll build it. Okay. Once you get this, just say OK, let it build. We're going to go back in and revise it. Okay. So say OK, rebuild the corridor, and it builds the corridor for you. So this is the corridor. Okay. It's very, very crude right now, but it needs a little bit it leads, it needs a little bit of work. Okay. When you look at this corridor in 3D, remember it's a 3D model, you'll see two issues right away, which are going to be a problem now and You'll see the same problem later when we get into the, more, the details of finalizing this. This is not in its final state right now. So if you click on it, you can uh, view the object, the object viewer, just like a surface in 3D. And if I click and hold and rotate, you'll see in 3D the road. But at the beginning and at the end, there's a spike. You see that? Right? It goes from zero, then it goes to my design profile, and then it goes back down to zero. It's got spikes. Now, why are those spikes present? Well, by default, when you build the corridor, it starts at the beginning of the horizontal alignment. And it goes all the way to the end of the horizontal alignment. So that's the range for the build. Your design, however, does not start at the beginning of the alignment, right? So my alignment, my alignment starts here at this station value. But my profile doesn't start until the edge of asphalt. So anything between the beginning of the horizontal alignment and the beginning of the vertical alignment if there's nothing there, if this profile doesn't extend all the way to there, it assumes the elevation is zero. Same thing on the end, right? My design ends here, but my horizontal alignment goes all the way to here, right? So again, at the end, it wants to build to here. If there's no design, it assumes an elevation of zero. So the way to remedy this, just to keep the model from misbehaving that way, right? So I'm going to look at it again, right-click, object viewer. You'll see at the beginning and at the end, 
There is no vertical design at the beginning of the horizontal alignment. There's no vertical design at the end of the horizontal alignment. So what we do, just as a housekeeping, is we click on the road, we take this grip, and we snap it to this point here. That's the first profile point. And we do the same at the end. Take this grip and snap to this node here. That's the end of the profile design. So now the range for the build is not the limit of my horizontal alignment, but the limit of my vertical alignment. And if I look at this in 3D, the spikes should be gone because there's no zero elevations anywhere. Okay, so there's the road. Those spikes are gone. Okay, so by default, the range for the build is the beginning of the horizontal alignment to the end of the horizontal alignment. I just grip edit the ends so that it coincides with the beginning of the vertical alignment and the end of the vertical alignment. Remember, these are the points where my profile design starts and ends. Okay, so that's how you get rid of your spikes. Another thing you'll notice is the frequency, right? See these blue lines? These blue lines are actually the cross-section elements. Let's look at this in more detail. So if I zoom in on those blue lines, you'll see your assembly with subassembly parts. See here? There's the center point. You don't get a line in the center. But if you look on the edge, you'll see, right, the plane here, 2% down. And you see the one, two, three planes of the curve in the other. And then you see the boulevard. So you can see that it's trying to build like a stick figure, a 3D stick figure of the surface of the road. Okay? And it's based on the cross-section data. Okay? The frequency, how frequent you see this cross-section information is one of the parameters you have control over. So I'm going to click on here, right-click, go back to corridor properties. And I'm going to change under parameters the frequencies. I'm going to set them all once and for all. As you add to this model, you have to change this all the time. So by default, all the frequencies are 25 meters. Okay, so you can see 25, 25, 25, 25. Along a tangent, I would say go every three meters. These are numbers that work. Okay? You can go bigger or smaller. The smaller the increment, the more accurate the model. Okay, but if you go too small, you'll end up with a lot of data and not necessarily any more detail. Okay, so let me show you what three meters does. So on the tangents, I'm going to go not every 25 meters, but three meters. On all the different curve points, okay, so our horizontal curve, a circular curve, I'm going to go every one meter. On a spiral, we don't have any, but I'm going to go every one meter. So the horizontal circular curve and spiral curve, if I have one, I want to cross section every meter. And then if I have a vertical curve, which we're not going to have any, but if I had a vertical curve, I'd want to do the same in the vertical. So on the tangents, on the straight sections of road, one meter. But if I have a circular curve or a spiral curve or a vertical curve, I want a cross-section every meter. And it will continue to build the surface of the road with straight lines. But if you make these frequencies smaller, you'll start to mimic the curvature better. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to say OK. I'm going to say OK. It's going to rebuild the corridor. And now wherever you have a curve, you're going to see a tighter grouping, right? So on a tangent, every three meters, so the distance between these blue lines is three meters. And then when you go around a curve, every one meter. So now it starts to look more like a curve, right? And same thing here. I have a curve, so every one meter. So at a glance, it looks curved. But if you zoom in, it's a bunch of straight lines. These are actually just straight lines. If I take the center and I offset it 3.95, remember 3.95 to the gutter, uh, to the asphalt edge. If I zoom in on that, here is the actual curve, right? That's the curve, but it's approximated by a bunch of straight lines. If you zoom in, right, it's a bunch of straight lines that makes it up. So if you change your frequency, you can you can mimic the curve. Okay, so it looks like a curve, but if you zoom in, it's not. The smaller you make that frequency, the more accurately it mimics the curve. Okay, but these are pretty good parameters. Every three meters on the straightaways, and every one meter on the curves gives you a pretty good, uh, a pretty good uh, representation. So I'm going to look at this in 3D again. And you can clearly see, you know, how close the cross sections are on the curve. Every one meter, and that's a distance along the center line, right? Center line one meter, center line one meter. Notice on the inside they're closer together. On the outside they're further apart, right? Because it's just wrapping it around the center of the of the, of the uh, alignment. Horizontal, vertical. Line. So the horizontal position comes from the horizontal alignment, the vertical comes from the profile, and then the cross-section comes from the assembly of the subassembly parts. Okay? 
that's basically it, right? Tell it horizontal alignment, vertical alignment, cross section. And then it'll drag it along. Imagine that the center line, horizontal and vertical, is like a closed line. And then that the subassembly with the uh, this assembly with the subassembly parts is like a coat hanger. And you're gonna drag that coat hanger along the horizontal vertical alignment. And that's the shape of the road. Okay? So we have these good visualization tools, the object viewer in 3D and so on, so you can actually see what's going on. So that's what the basic corridor looks like. Okay? There's a couple of there's three things not quite perfect about this yet. Okay, we're gonna get to that. Um, it does not represent the elbow correctly, and it does not represent the cul-de-sac correctly. Even the intersection right, doesn't work too well, right? The, the, road, the road looks like it wants to go all the way to here, when really it should stop at the curb and go around, right? It should really respect this alignment. The street line should be way out here. The street line should be way out here. So when it comes to this corridor, it's pretty good, right? On the straightaways, your typical 20s, it's perfect, right? Between the elbow and the crescent everything along here is perfect now we have to manage the bulb and the uh, crescent and the intersection so like i said before when you're doing these roads the standard typical width pretty much takes care of itself you spend most of your time dealing with these areas where you have these weird widenings, right? Called the sacs, crescents, and intersections. That's where most of your time is spent, right? So if this was a standard 20 meter right of way for 30 kilometers, it would be fine. But if you put it in an elbow, oh, now I gotta concentrate on that a little bit. Oh, there's a cul de sac at the end, now I gotta concentrate on that. That's well. Oh, there's an intersection, I gotta deal with that. So most of your time is managing the oddly shaped things as opposed to the standard. Any questions about the corridor so far? The three basic building blocks. Horizontal alignment, vertical alignment, cross-section data, which is the assembly with the sub-assemblies. You marry them all together. Then you can limit your range. Not horizontal range, but vertical range, so you don't get those spikes at the beginning and the end. And now it's almost done, except for the elbow, the intersection, and the uh, cul-de-sac. Okay, so let me you because everybody did the assignment so I've got all 40 students assignments I'm going to draw the crescent and the cul-de-sac edge of pavement so if you got this wrong uh, when are you posting assignment? Uh, it's, it's, I just have to uh, make it available so it's already on the list of today what is the answer to let me go back now and do a little bit of review I want to go back and draw the edge of pavement for you on this entire subdivision Okay, with the crescent and the elbow. And I'm going to look at the standards to do it. So right now, this is on a layer called zero. Just like anything else, I'm going to put it on the layer called corridor. Not zero, let me put it on the layer called corridor. So C corridor should be a layer in the drawing. Corridor or C corridor, C corridor. I'm going to put it there on the corridor layer. see it's frozen. So it's frozen, so if I want to see it again, I'll thaw it. So it's no longer on layer zero, just like the surface, right? When you build these things, you don't want to have anything on layer zero, so put it on a layer called corridor. And then I'm going to just freeze it. I don't want to see it right now. So let me review how to draw your edge of pavement again. Let me get rid of these. I don't need them anymore. Again, you can put them on the frozen layer, or you can delete them. It's up to you if you want to do. So this is just a bit of review of the assignment that you're supposed to do. Because if you made this, any mistakes here. So if you didn't get 4 out of 4 on the alignment, here's where you went, you went wrong. So if you offset 10 meters, you get to the center. So there's the center and there's the center. And you do that all the way along. Okay. That center line has to go all the way to the street line. Okay. A couple of people didn't send the alignment to the center of the street line. They ended their alignment at the whoops at the center of the circle. So this was a common mistake uh, a couple people made. So your your alignment goes all the way to the edge of the subdivision, not to 
the center of the circle. That's wrong. It's too short. You have to take it all the way along to here. And if you stopped it at the edge of asphalt or edge of pavement, it's also wrong. It's got to go all the way to the street line. At the other end, it doesn't stop at the center line of the existing road. It goes all the way across the street to the opposite street line. So that was the extent. And then if you put zero in the right spot and you have the correct radius here, this radius should have been... should be... Uh, 14.5 from the crescent standard. Uh, you should have a total length that matches what I had here. That's how I marked it. Um, so you would have got four out of four. So is the center line in the right spot? Is the length at the beginning and at the end in the right spot? At the, uh, the beginning and the end point in the right spot? Uh, and so on. So that's the center line. There was four marks for that. To draw your edge of asphalt, then you can offset that by 4.25. Not asphalt, edge of pavement, sorry. Offset 4.25. There's basically where it is. It's no good in the intersection. How do I draw the intersection? Well, I'm going to draw a line near point. No, sorry, I'll snap. I'm going to use my end point. I'm going to draw a line from here to here to here. I'm just tracing the edge of asphalt from the topo. It's not a straight line. It's a connect the dots kind of an exercise. And then I'm going to fill it with a radius of 7.5. My gutter line with this line, that's the wrong thing to do. This is asphalt. Sorry, this is the edge of asphalt. This is the gutter line. So they're two different things. You can't do that. What I do is I offset 0.3. If there was a gutter, where would it be? It would be right here, 0.3 meters away from the existing edge of asphalt. And now I can fill it a radius of 7.5. My gutter line to the theoretical gutter line of the road. And then I'm going to erase, explode this, and I'm going to erase this. So the curve comes around, and the gutter is in a position so that it's 0.3 meters away from the existing edge of asphalt. You have to do the same thing on the other side. Offset 0.3. Most people got this right. And you have to do both sides separately because they're not parallel. 7.5. Fill it this with this. And then again, explode this and get rid of this line. Now I don't need the trace lines anymore. That's what your edge of uh, gutter should look like. It, it comes around at 7.5 meter radius, and it does not touch the asphalt. It would touch where the theoretical gutter would be. So that's all we do. So that's how we transition from a urban section to a rural section. The curve comes, goes around, and stops as soon as it's parallel. Okay. In here now, to draw this, I'm going to go back to the standard. So I want to interpret this for you in case you weren't sure. This would have been the standard here. The approach to drawing the cul-de-sac and the crescent is the same. I'm going to use the exact same approach. There are three parts. There's this curve here, there's this curve here, and this curve here. There are three arcs. Okay. In this one, there are also three arcs. Right. There's the main arc in the center, and then there's this curve and this curve on the side. There are three arcs. The approach is exactly the same. Draw the one in the center first, the middle one, and then the other two will fall into place. Where does this arc go? Well, the center of it is take the property line on the opposite side of the road, offset it 4.5, that's the center of the circle, and then the radius is 12.5. So here's how you draw that. We're going to offset 4.5, this street line, and this street line. And then where they intersect is the center of the circle out here. So you could either fill it with a radius of 0, fill it with a radius of 0 to bring these two together. There's the center. Or you can use your O-snaps. And the O snap you want to use is uh, intersection. Use your intersection O snap. And you use it in two parts. Okay? I'm going to draw a circle where the intersection of these two lines. So instead of, see how when I, if I click here, see how it's just an X? The little marker is just an X? Well, if the actual location of where those two lines intersect is not actually shown, instead of picking one location and draw from an intersection, I can pick one line. I can click here, intersection. See that dot, dot, dot next to the X? That means I can pick two things to find an intersection. So I can go here, pick one thing because the intersection exists, or I can click here with that dot, dot, dot present, and then click the other thing, and it'll solve it for me. There's the intersection of those two lines. That's the intersection. Okay, and what's the radius? 12.5. That's where the center arc goes. 
So your O snaps, you have to really use them properly. If, if you want to draw a line with an intersection that exists, whoops, sorry, too many clicks of the button here. If you want to draw and click on the spot where the intersection is explicitly shown, then it's one pick, right? So L, I, N, T, right? If this intersection exists, you can pick it. If you don't want to snap there, uh, if you draw a line, I, N, T, you can go off the thing, and it gives you that dot, 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 and then you get to pick two things. I want the intersection of this thing with this thing, and it solves it for you. So you don't have to necessarily fill it, these two together. Okay, so that's how I do it. It's up to you. Again, these are just little tips and tricks that are along the way. Now, the last two curves, if I go back to the standard, this arc and this arc are the same. The radius is 3, 35, 75. So now what I want to use is a fillet command. To fill it, I need to break the circle. There's a couple of ways of doing it. ER for break, and I can click on the circle and then break it. That's one way. Or I can trim it. Trim it between two lines and break it that way. It has to be an arc. And then I use a fillet with a radius of 35.75 between this arc and this straight line. And this arc and this straight line. That's how you draw your three arcs. You start with the center one, and then you use the fillet command on either side. And that's how you get your gutter line on the outside. Okay? And then you don't need these construction lines anymore. On the inside, on the inside, it actually has a radius of 10.25, which, if you do the math, it's parallel to the inside. If you offset the outs, the inside to here by 425, if you list this arc, oops, if I list this arc. It's already 1025. So it's symmetrical. So your cross section is only getting wider on the outside, not on the inside. The horizontal distance from the center to the edge of pavement on the inside is consistent 4.25 all the way around the inside. It only gets wider on the outside. So that's how you draw this eyebrow out here. The arc here has the same thing. Draw the one in the middle first and use the fillet command. Okay? And if you interpret this, the center arc has a radius of 15, and it's right in the middle of the right-of-way. Right? All these one, two, three arcs are all concentric. They have a center of the arc there, so I'm going to draw a circle at the center of the right-of-way, 15 meters. So I'm going to draw a circle, C-E-N, 15, and then I want to fill it. Again, I have to either break it or trim it. I can't fill it to a circle, so I'm going to trim between these two lines this. Go back to the standard. It's going to tell me the radius here is 36.5. Fill it with a radius 36.5. And that's how I get from here to here. That's how I get from here to here. And now I have my, what I call pavement, which is the gutter line location. So that's how you draw those. I didn't show this to anybody. Some people asked me, how do you do it? And I said, uh, figure it out. And most of you did a very good job. There was a couple that uh, had a few issues. Uh, this was probably the most complicated thing because you had to trace and offset the uh, edge of asphalt. But this one and this one, although the geometry is different, the technique is exactly the same. Draw the one in the middle first and then fill it to get the arc on either side. Okay. So those of you who got four out of four on the third item did this perfectly. Okay? If, uh, if you didn't have uh, the intersection right, you lost the mark. If you had the elbow wrong, you lost another mark. If you got the cul-de-sac wrong, you lost the third mark. And if you didn't have the standard width, if this distance was not 4.25, you lost another mark. Okay? So you had to have the standard width correct, and then the three special areas, intersection, uh, asphalt, uh, intersection, um, cul-de-sac, and uh, crescent correct. So that was the four marks there. Those things need to be done correctly because they have an influence on where you draw your points, right? If I want to know where this zone ends, right? I want to draw a line from the end of this arc, perpendicular to center. I'm going to extend that to both sides of the street line. That's the last time you have a standard 20 meter right of way. This is 20 meters. 20 meters. Beyond that, it gets wider and then narrow. And then where do you get your standard 20 back? Well, from the end of this curve, perpendicular and across to here. And that's where your standard 20 meter starts again. So between here and here is where you have your kind of abnormal width. And this is the point, station value, 
uh, at the beginning and the station value at the end of the zone. So that's where you put your point. That's one station I need. This is another station I need. And then I project them. You might remember this. I go to... Um, points. There's more, but let me just do these as an example. When I project them here, and I'm going to bring them into range, I'm going to use existing ground, because it's not the vertical I'm interested in, just the horizontal, where's the station value. This PVI, the beginning and the end, the PVI location of the profile is born from these two points, which come from the plane. So if you drew this wrong, if you drew these arcs in the wrong spot, then these points would be in the wrong spot then these profile stations would be in the wrong spot. And so that's what I mean. That's why I highlighted If you got your email from me today, uh, this, there's two uh, highlighted areas. The second one, the third item down, I think. If you drew this wrong, if you didn't get four out of four, then your points and profile are going to be in the wrong spot. Now if they move, right? if you move this, if you redraw that correctly and move it, in the profile it changes position. And you say, oh, this PVI should be over here, node, right? And then you go back and you change the slopes so that it all works. Okay. Back to here, and then just type in all the slopes again. If you move a point, then you have to type in all the slopes again. Okay, I see some questions right there. Uh, four to four, two to two. I think there's two of them that are two. There's four that are other things. Hang on, there's, there's two that are worth four out of four each. Yeah, sorry, it should be four. So there's the, the alignment should be four marks out of four, and then the edge of gutter back to curve should be four out of four. So it's eight marks. I might have said it wrong in the email. I'll forget now. I'll take a look at it again. I might have, might have stated it wrong. Okay, but there are two highlighted spots. If you didn't get perfect on those two, then yeah, you can see. All right, so that's how you draw the elbow and the cul-de-sac. Here, again, if you draw that correctly, that's another one. Okay, and again, you can't mirror. Watch this. If I mirror on center this arc, near, near, I'm not going to get the same solution. They're actually different. See, they're two different things. Why? Because... The existing edge of pay, uh, edge of asphalt is not a consistent bearing, right? There's a bunch of pieces, so you have to use the piece on one side, the piece on the other side. Otherwise, it won't work. So you can't draw one and then mirror it. You have to do each one separately the way I do. Uh, north arrow should be one mark. I'll have to look at that again. Let me, let me, let me take a quick look. Uh, at the assignments. If you had an issue with the way I marked it, uh, send me an email. I, I hope I didn't shift numbers. I might have shifted it. it. Sounds like there's some issues there. Oh, okay. I might have to reissue this. Let me just check. Okay. So I, I might have done something stupid in my email. Let me, let me check it. Okay. I might have to send you a new email once I figure out what's going on. It sounds like I've done something in error. I'll check it again. All right, so any questions about the corridor?